The U.S. military estimates more than 100,000 civilians have died in the Iraq war. That number comes from the 400,000 secret U.S. military records leaked by WikiLeaks. In his new memoir, General Hugh Shelton, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, calls the Iraq war unnecessary and that the Bush administration went to war based on a series of lies, he says, and that's in quotes. Strong words from a man who was once the military's top officer. He was born and raised on a farm in the small town of Speed, North Carolina. After college as an ROTC student, Henry Hugh Shelton completed his two-year army commitment. But in 1966, he re-enlisted so that he could fight with his men in Vietnam. He trained to become a Green Beret and was part of an elite Special Forces A-team. Moving swiftly up through the ranks, he was promoted to general in 1988. He led air assault forces in Operation Desert Storm, the first Gulf War. But he would become an international figure in 1994 when he was put in charge of restoring democracy to Haiti. Later, President Clinton appointed Shelton chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Will survive confirmation, Mr. President. I have reason to believe that General Shelton could survive just about anything. <laughs> and in the late 1990s, he oversaw the U.S. and NATO interventions to bring freedom to Kosovo and also Operation Desert Robert Fox against Saddam Hussein. When President Bush took office, Shelton stayed on as chairman and he was there for 9-11, retiring at the end of September 2001. Over a long career of wars and more than 400 parachute jumps, it was civilian life that nearly killed him when he fell from a ladder and was paralyzed from the neck down. And joining me now, General Hugh Shelton. Welcome to This Week. Thanks, Christiane. Great to be with you. It was prescient what President Clinton said, that you could survive just about anything. Tell me how you survived that, that fall. Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, after falling off the ladder and being evacuated quickly to a local hospital and told I would never walk again, uh, Walter Reed came to the emergency, came to, and uh, Dr. Jim Eklund immediately evacuated me out to Walter Reed. They did a kind of a, 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 an advanced technique on me to raise my blood pressure, force the blood in around the, uh, the, the cells. And miraculously, I walked out after 83 days from and they Walter say Reed. A once in a, in a million cure in that regard. Well, at Walter Reed, they said they had never seen anyone recover from that type of an injury. And uh, now I could serve as an inspiration to others that suffer the same type of injury. Well, let me ask you to, to put your analyst cap on now based on your war experience. In Iraq, drawdown of combat forces, and yet troubling reports that the linchpin to success, bringing the Sunni groups on, the Sunni awakening, may be crumbling. Reports that the Sunni awakening cells are being recruited or defecting or being kicked out by the Iraqi government back to Al-Qaeda. Very, very disturbing, but I would say not unexpected. I think that, you know, all along we've said we were going to provide an environment that the Iraqi people could form a government, but and now it's up to them to really come to the... To the uh, right, but if those people go back to Al-Qaeda, doesn't that imply that there could be more violence, that you will continue to have that division between Sunni and Shiite? Without a doubt, Christiane, and I think all along, you know, if you listen to the leaders in the Middle East, like King Abdullah, a great friend, who would say what, what will it will take to rule Iraq will be a strong government, a strong man, hopefully not like Saddam, but someone that can keep those three factions apart. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, again, one of the things that they're trying to emulate is to bring the Taliban in like they try to do with the Sunnis in Iraq. What do you think of bringing the Taliban in? Do you think negotiations will work? I think that we've got to be very careful. I, I believe that the, the Afghanistan people will be very, very concerned. And we see, we see reports now, the warlords are even starting to get concerned about how much control the Taliban will have. Mm -hmm. Trying to strike some type of an agreement with them, I think, is a reasonable course of action. But Karzai's government has got to remain in charge and, and uh, governing that country. And how long do you think it will take? Obviously, much publicity and much attention about President Obama's uh, summertime 2011 withdrawal or rather drawdown. Do you think that that's possible? I'm very, very concerned. We couldn't ask for better military leadership. Our men and women are doing a great job. But 
you know, we're dealing with a 14th century culture, the second most corrupt nation in, in, the, in the world, and now we've got to have Karzai be in position by 2011 to really maintain control as we start to pull our combat forces out. And I'm not, too, I'm not sure we haven't given our military a goal that is a bridge too far. A bridge too far. What do you think about WikiLeaks obviously has come out with another huge amount of documentation about the uh, Iraq war this time. And they focus quite heavily on subcontractors. I've seen them in the field. They are quite controversial in, in many instances. Is American war fighting changing? Is it being outsourced too much? I, I don't believe it's being outsourced too much, and I do believe that we need better controls over the contractors that are out in the field. But certainly, when you look at the nation-building aspect of, of the mission that we have in Afghanistan, as an example, those requirements far exceed what the military has the capability to do. And so if you want those things done, you have to either go to contractors or the other elements of our government, Commerce, Justice Department, et cetera, they have to be able to come in and, and work those issues because the military can't get there from here. So, let's go, controls. Let's go back to when you were chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and even slightly afterwards when President Bush decided to go to war in Iraq. You talk about it was based on, on faulty intelligence and indeed on lies and deceit, but you also say something about insubordination. You say, for instance, during meetings, some people were kept on after Bush had tendered his opinion and issued an instruction based on that opinion. Yet certain strong-willed individuals seem to disregard him and forge ahead with their own agendas almost to the point of insubordination. That's very strong indictment. Well, there was a very strong push in those days for, uh, for us to go into Iraq, and there was absolutely no intelligence, zero. That pointed, toward Al that pointed toward the Iraqis. It was all Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. And yet there was an element there that was, that was pushing to go in, into Iraq at the same but time. But what do you mean about insubordination? The fact that the president says himself, we're not going to, we're not going to do that right now. Let's focus on Afghanistan, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda. Yet below the surface, we still had this element that said, let's keep planning for Iraq just in case we can convince him that we can go. And you, and you think they could have convinced him? Not at that time. I think that, uh, as President Bush told me at Camp David, you know, I just don't see it. You know, we may go get Saddam and take him out, but it'll be at a time and a place of our choosing. It won't be as a part of the Afghanistan operation. He got it from day one when, when he was briefed by the CIA. So you're saying he was pushed into it? Uh, I think eventually that uh, that same drumbeat continued, and Afghanistan, remember, was going very, very well. The drumbeat back here in Washington was still pushing, coming out of the mm -hmm. Pentagon. Let's go to Iraq. Let's get, let's take him out. And he finally said, let's go. We walked out on the limb before we could build a coalition of the, uh, either the United Nations or NATO, one of the two. You're very, you have some harsh words about then Secretary of Defense uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Is he part of the group that you're targeting here? Well, I, I, I personally like Secretary Rumsfeld, but he was part of the group, he and the Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, that continued to push to go into Iraq. In your book, you write about an extraordinary moment when the nuclear codes seem to have been lost, and this was under President Clinton. Describe what happened. Well, we had a team in, that worked for me in the Joint Chiefs that was responsible for going over and checking the codes and making sure they were there on a monthly basis. And uh, we found out that for two consecutive periods, that uh, two consecutive periods, that when they went over, there was always a reason why the codes were not available. They were in the Oval Office. The president was in a meeting, or he was with an important official. Therefore, they couldn't get to him right then. And our guys accepted that. And it wasn't until uh, they went over to have to exchange the codes, physically take one set, give them another one, that they couldn't produce them. And it was at that point, of course, we, uh, we changed everything instantaneously, but could not, did not know for exactly how long they had been missing. Let me ask you about Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I want to put up what a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs told this week, this program, several months ago. Today we've changed. The country has changed. I'm personally of the view now that attitudes have changed. And I think it is perfectly acceptable to get rid of the law and the policy. Is it time, General Shelton, to get rid of that policy? 
Christiane, I think it's time to let's see what the men and women that are at the basic combat unit, particularly the men in the Marines and the Army, have to say at, when the survey comes in on the 1st of December. Will you we, support it if the Pentagon Review says that it's time to get rid of it? If the men and women in, in uniform at the fighting level, particular Marines and Army, say, you know, it doesn't make any difference to us, and therefore it won't break the readiness of our great armed forces. Why do you think, think it would? I mean, look, some of the great allies that the United States have, whether it's Canada, whether it's Britain, France, Australia, even Israel allows openly gay men and women to serve in the military, and they have great armies, great militaries. They have great uh, militaries, great armies, but if you check the historical records, Christian, as you know, we've never lost to any of them. We are the top of the pile. We are the best in the world, and we want to stay that way. And if this policy is related to combat readiness, see, these guys, these individuals don't go home at night. It's not the corporate world. You and I can go home at night. We live our own lives, etc. These individuals are intense. They're in barracks. They fight for one another. Who's on the left? Who's on the right? I think it's extremely important that we find out from them whether or not this is going to change why they fight. If it does, we got a problem. If it doesn't, then On we'll that proceed. note, this is obviously a current uh, issue that's being debated yes. and it will be finalized, we think, in a couple of months at least. General Shelton, thank you very much indeed for joining us.